Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining me here today. If you're new, I'm Amanda. Welcome to the channel where we are all about shattering the mental health stigma. If you haven't already, please make sure you make sweet, sweet love to that subscribe button. Give the bell a few kisses so you're not missing any of this content designed to help you with your mental health or help you help someone else. Yeah, today's video is going to talk about the death penalty, but considering I'm somewhere between Dexter Morgan and Elle Woods on the matter, I'm really in no position to try to sway your opinion on it. Whatever side you're on, this video is just meant to encourage some reflection. Look, I don't typically watch the news because I don't consider its consumption as being informed, so it really honestly holds no value to me. I came across the case of Ivan Cantu while I was researching for my internship position. I'm creating this video because the outcome of this case is weighing really heavily on my mental health, as the implications it has and the justice aspect of our so-called justice system is really creating this intense anxiety in me. First, let me give you a rundown of the case. Ivan Cantu was convicted of capital murder in 2001 over a fatal shooting in 2000 that killed his cousin James Mosqueda and James's girlfriend Amy Kitchen. Police found bloody jeans in Ivan's apartment that had the victim's DNA and a key to their home. The state's case relied heavily on these clothes and witness testimony from Ivan's then-girlfriend Amy Bocher and her brother Jeff Bocher. Amy Bocher, the prosecution's main witness, testified that Ivan stole and later sold Mosqueda's Rolex and that he proposed to her the night of the murder with a ring Ivan stole from Kitchen. It also focused on one of Ivan's trial attorneys signing an affidavit claiming that Ivan privately admitted to the murder at the time. They also brought up the finding of Ivan's gun at his ex-girlfriend's home with Mosqueda's blood on the barrel and Ivan's fingerprints on the magazine. All right, a gun with the victim's DNA, the Sussex fingerprints, an alleged confession, bloody clothes found in the home of the suspect, and eyewitness testimony giving robbery as a motive. Okay, that's, that's pretty damning, right? But oh, the plot thickens. The jeans were found to be two sizes too large for Cantu, tests on them for his DNA were inconclusive, and the police officer who swept his apartment the next day did not see the bloody clothes in the trash can, something she claimed she couldn't have missed. They actually weren't discovered until several days later, which supports the defense's theory that someone else put them in the trash can. Mosqueda's Rolex that Amy Bocher testified Ivan stole and sold was later found by Mosqueda's family, and as for the engagement ring, witnesses confirmed Cantu and Bocher had announced their engagement and showed off that ring a week before the killings. So that punched a whole lot of holes in her testimony. After she passed away in 2021, her brother Jeff admitted in court documents that he lied when he testified that Cantu told him about the murders in advance and asked him to help clean up the crime scene. He also stated that his testimony wasn't credible in the first place as he had a documented history of drug abuse at the time of testifying. That leaves us with the gun, which is certainly suspicious, but that's more circumstantial evidence than direct as the connection between Ivan, the gun, and the crime scene is open for interpretation and inference. It implies a fact, but it doesn't directly prove it. There are plenty of explanations as to why his fingerprint could have been on the magazine that have absolutely nothing to do with murder, especially since fingerprints don't erode as quickly as other evidence might. The fact the fact that the gun was found at the ex's residence adds a layer of complexity because that now requires inference as to why it got there. As the evidence that was presented unraveled, several jurors, including the jury foreman, felt like the jury didn't have all the information when they reached a verdict and urged the powers that be to consider emerging facts and give Ivan a fair trial. Even celebrities such as Kim Kardashian, Martin Sheen, and Jane Fonda, think of them what you will, use their platforms to encourage Texas representatives and the public not to release Ivan, not to paint him as a saint or plead his innocence, but simply to postpone his execution so that he could be given a fair trial. You know, something we are supposed to be guaranteed by the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution. Ivan maintained his innocence until his dying breath. I want you to know that I never killed James and Amy he said, according to a transcript provided by the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. And if I did, if I knew who did, you would have been the first to know any information. He went on to state that he didn't think his death would bring any closure, but if it did, so be it. He gave thanks to his attorneys, family, and supporters and recited Matthew 621 from the Bible, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also, before stating that he was ready to receive the lethal injection. 
This man, despite key witnesses confessing to lying, inconclusive DNA evidence tying him to the scene of the crime, and police testimony suggesting someone tampering with evidence, was executed on February 28th, 2024. In watching a jailhouse interview with him about a week before his death, I believe his claims of innocence. He was well-spoken and well-adjusted, not emotionless, unstable, or cocky like a lot of the killers that I've seen interviews with. He talked of the pain of being several feet from his mom during trials and not being able to hug her, and mentioned how much he was looking forward just to hugging her again when he got out. He wasn't asking people to allow him that experience. It seemed that he genuinely believed that justice would prevail and that he would be free again. Look. I don't give two humps less than a camel what anyone thinks of the death penalty or really even as Ivan as an individual. To say that there was reasonable doubt in this case is an understatement. When the facts that had been presented at the trial that had swayed jury members were proven to be false, Ivan Cantu deserved to have his case re-examined, period, end of story. But how does all of this tie into mental health? You know, the purpose of this channel, you might be asking. Well. If Ivan Cantu was in fact innocent, think about the fear and anxiety and distress that he must have felt being confined to a violent environment with no autonomy, stripped of any dignity or comfort, and facing imminent execution for years, decades in fact. There's also Ivan's family, who are likely riddled with crippling grief and confusion and guilt and anger that might never be resolved. There's the victim's families that might be feeling guilt as Ivan's death didn't bring the closure that they were hoping for, and now they're left questioning whether they let an innocent man die. There's those involved in the legal process, like the judge and the prosecution, who might face ethical and moral distress as they question whether they let an innocent man be convicted and executed on their watch. There's Ivan's advocates who saw the human side of him only to find frustration and disappointment and feelings of failure on the other side when they lost this battle for justice. Then there's the mental implications for society at large. That's me. That's you. This might have happened in Texas, but this isn't confined to a particular state or a particular politician. Let me ask you this. With what you've heard in this video, how are you feeling right now about the justice system as a whole? Because this case was not only enough to make me lose faith in that system, much like Christopher Reeve's death played a big part in me losing my religious faith. Let me know, by the way, if you want a video on that sometime in the future. But this case has left me genuinely terrified. The very thought that weak circumstantial evidence and a lazy system was enough to literally end a man's life has definitely heightened stress and anxiety and cynicism in me. I mean, what if one of my clients were to be murdered and I become a suspect because their neighbor, who's the real killer, saw me at their house and stashed clothes with the victim's blood in my car? What if someone shoots and kills my boyfriend with his own gun and I get blamed for it because I've taken it shooting and my fingerprints are on it? I know even my hardcore pro-death penalty people out there do not believe that someone should be executed unless they could be proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt another thing that is supposed to be guaranteed by our legal system. It reaches into the hearts and minds of us all, making us reevaluate our trust in this system that's meant to protect and serve. I know that this video is different than my normal content, but sometimes I like to change it up and I like to encourage you guys to think. And I hope that me sharing this will be a catalyst for ongoing respectful conversation. Let me know in the comments how you think this case should have been handled. Do you think that changes need to be made to the legal system? If you're new to the world of justice reform, or even if you are not, I'm going to link some resources in the description below just to give you some more information and allow you to be fully informed. As always, I encourage people to share their mental health stories, good, bad, and crazy here in the comments. And today I invite you to let us know also if the information shared here today has impacted your mental health in some way, or if you have any personal stories with the legal system that may have affected your mental health or shifted your opinions in the justice system. As always, I love you guys so much, and I'll see you soon. Mwah.